Okay, let's go on to lecture three, which is food poisoning and foodborne disease and personal hygiene. The aim of this unit is to increase your understanding of food contamination and the importance of personal hygiene. And by the end of this unit, you will be able to identify the main sources of bacterial contamination, give examples of action which should be taken to prevent the contamination of food, and state and explain the reasons for high standards of personal hygiene. So what is food poisoning? Well, it's an acute illness caused by the consumption of contaminated or poisonous food. Uh, the main thing to remember there is an acute illness, which means it happens quickly. So it could happen within one hour of ingesting uh, poisonous food, as opposed to a chronic illness, which could take a long time to develop. So a couple of definitions which could well come up on the exam is what is an incubation period? It's a time taken for when you first ingest the food to when you start showing the signs and symptoms of food poisoning. And that could be anything from 1 to 36 hours. Uh, duration of food poisoning, again another question that's possibly going to come up. Anything between 1 and 7 days. And it's all about with food poisoning, large numbers causing illness. Now, foodborne diseases enter our system via the fecal oral route, uh, which means it's uh, from an animal's or somebody else's arse to your mouth. Um, and it's where the bacteria are in uh, things like water on food already. And these uh, are where small numbers cause illness. They're called low dose pathogens. Let's go to personal hygiene. Now you must maintain the highest possible standards of personal hygiene to avoid contaminating food. Um, let's have a look at the protective clothing that you must wear or should wear uh, in a place of work. Uh, overalls, jackets, trousers, aprons, hats, hairnets, neck coverings, safety shoes, boots and gloves. Although I have been in uh, quite a few establishments lately where the uh, fashion is with chefs not to wear any uh, hats or hairnets, uh, which is okay if uh, you don't mind any uh, psoriasis, dandruff or eczema or hair falling onto your food, but personally I'd rather not have that uh, option. Try to avoid uh, wearing jewellery, um, especially uh, earrings which could fall into food and act as a physical contaminant. Watches, uh, where you could get a build-up of uh, food and other dirt and debris underneath the strap. Perfumes and aftershaves, which could chemically contaminate food. Uh, the wearing of heavy makeup, again, which uh, parts could fall off in the food and act as a physical contaminant. And nail varnish, which again could have the same effect. A question that could well come up uh, in the exam is when do you or what do you put on first when you're wearing your protective clothing? Always put your hats on first. And habits which you should engage in uh, do not smoke, do not cough or sneeze over food, do not pick your nose or any other orifice when you're preparing food, uh, do not spit, do not bite nails or lick fingers, do not eat in the food area, do not scratch or touch yourself or don't touch your face or hair. Again, if you do, just wash your hands because obviously um, you've contaminated them by coming into contact with your skin. Uh, what you should do all is cover cuts with a blue waterproof plaster. Uh, the colour is to uh, see it if it falls into food uh, because it's only the only natural blue colour um, that's uh, available. You won't see it in, in uh, food in general. And also, it's the main thing is is to prevent uh, microbiological contamination um, entering the food from your cut or graze or whatever it happens to be. Keep your nails short and clean um, because if you keep them short, they are easier to keep clean. Wash your hands regularly. Report illnesses and septic wounds. Uh, these are reported to your line manager or supervisor. Um, there's probably going to be a question come up on what is a healthy carrier. Uh, let's go through the, food, food, the, the two definitions first. A case of food poisoning is a person suffering from the illness. A healthy carrier or carrier is an infected person without the symptoms. So they're actually carrying the bacterial food poisoning um, bug, if you like, but they're not showing any of the symptoms. 
probably because they got some sort of immunity to it, but they can pass the infection on to other people via the food, etc. Uh, when do you wash your hands? Well, there are several areas. The first few, which I'm going to put in red, are the ones which uh, has the priority, if you like, for washing your hands. And we're going to wash them by what we call a two-system wash. So firstly, uh, entering a food room once you enter work, you wash your hands. Using the toilet, handling raw food, changing a dressing, dealing with an ill customer. Cleaning up any dog dirt or handling a dirty nappy. These are all in red. These are the priority. Uh, if you come into contact with any of these, you must wash your hands by a double wash system uh, straight away. Other times uh, which are not uh, a priority to wash your hands twice, but certainly you should have washed them once, uh, touching hair, nose or face, smoking, eating, coughing, sneezing, blowing your nose, cleaning, handling waste material, handling money, handling external packaging. Again, not as important as the red areas, but certainly you still need to wash your hands after uh, engaging in any of these. Uh, effective hand washing, uh, here's a graphic really of how you should do it. Start by wetting your hands and a nail brush with warm water. Uh, the temperatures are relevant, uh, you don't want it too hot because you scald your hands too cold, you don't want to wash your hands. Uh, then you put some liquid soap onto a soap brush, don't use bar soap or antibacterial soap. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second. Brush and lather in number three. The more you need to do then is do your fingernails uh, there, then rinse the brush off, put some soap into your hands, build up a lather, rinse, and then before your towel dry, if you're doing a double hand wash system, you go back to number one, repeat the cycle, and then towel dry. For the single ash one, hand wash system, just go from one to eight. The reason you shouldn't be using any chemicals such as bacteria sides. Uh, is because they will affect the bacteria. They'll um, produce a, an immunity in a bacteria, uh, which means uh, they develop a resistance and they become sort of superbugs, which you can't kill. Similarly, don't only use uh, hand wash uh, soap and water. Don't use uh, anything like uh, chemical gels, you know, the uh, alcohol gels, because they have the same effect as the other chemicals they will cause the bacteria to become immune and uh, they will build up this defense um, report illnesses to supervisor again very important there are certain illnesses you must report to your supervisor diarrhea vomiting or foodborne disease for example if you've eaten any suspect food um, in other words perhaps you've gone to a party you've eaten food uh, the same as everybody else there, uh, they've all come down with food poisoning and you haven't. Could well be you become a carrier. Uh, any close family contact with members of the family that might have food poisoning symptoms. If you're ill whilst abroad, again, report it to your supervisor. So things like Delhi Belly or Bombay Bum, you must report it to your supervisor before you return to work. If you've got any septic cuts and boils, if you've got a serious colds and flu, which obviously promotes coughing, if you've got any skin infections. So let's have a look at the types of contamination. You've got, first of all, microbial contamination. Uh, this is caused by the microscopic bugs, if you like, bacteria, viruses, moles, yeasts, and parasites. These are the ones that are, are difficult to see, if impossible to see. Then you've got chemical contamination. You've got physical contamination, such uh, as items you can see, like a, a screw, which could be a food safety hazard anyway, or just something innocuous, like a, a piece of plastic or a little bit of string. And lastly, allergenic, uh, for example, nuts, casein, soy, but any of the 14 allergens, which I've already mentioned. Uh, contamination, uh, let's have a look at physical contamination. How can that get into food? Uh, glass could get in from uh, broken light bulbs. This is why there's a no glass policy in kitchens. Uh, nuts and bolts could come from uh, poorly maintained machinery. Packaging materials such as plastic, cardboard, uh, string, staples, etc. 
bones and shells um, are really inherent contamination that come from things like chicken uh, and any shellfish, for example. And then jewellery, cigarette ends, plasters, the sort of things that would come from the members of staff. Uh, I remember once where uh, a plaster was found in the middle of a pork pie uh, with the finger still in the plaster. So again, just, just watch out for the contaminants. Uh, there's an example there where a mouse was actually found in a loaf of bread. Um, it's been cooked and sliced with the bread, but the core temperature of the mouse was over 75 degrees C, so it's quite safe to eat. Uh, what is cross-contamination? Um, a definition there, then cross-contamination is the transfer of food poisoning bacteria from a source to a high-risk food. As an example, uh, you could get direct contact with raw chicken, where you've got all the contamination on the skin, uh, especially Campylobacter, coming into physical contact with cooked, ready-to-eat food. There's one type of cross-contamination, direct contact. Then we've got indirect, where the bugs or the bacteria or the contamination goes from the raw product to the cooked product via um, a chopping board, a knife, uh, a cloth or some other intermediary. So let's have a look at um, indirect cross-contamination in more detail. So you've got various problem areas here. You've got birds, you've got flies, you've got raw meat, you've got raw fish, uh, pets, you've got rodents, you've got packaging, you've got bins. So these are all sources of bacterial contamination. And the vehicles, as we call them, uh, could be of fomites, could be cloths, hands, uh, bowls, could be chopping boards, knives, um, or any food surfaces. Now, one thing that could possibly come up as a question, what's the biggest source of cross-contamination in the kitchen? And the answer is the hands. So remember that one. And when the bacteria goes to high-risk foods, uh, which I showed you earlier, then it'll start to multiply in large numbers and cause food poisoning. And another example of cross-contamination where you've got drip, for example, raw meat juices going on to high-risk food. So this is, as I mentioned earlier, with a fridge, always make sure raw is kept in the bottom uh, part of the fridge in a covered container and any high-risk food above that. And preservation of food. How do you make your food or drink last longer? Well, uh, preservation methods remove one or more requirements for bacterial growth. So removing food, moisture, warmth or time, in other words. So we can have uh, high temperature food preservation, for example, pasteurization. Uh, an example there is milk where it's been heated for 72.2 degrees C for 15 seconds. Egg for 64.4 degrees C for two and a half minutes. But anything above 63 degrees C is uh, classed as a temperature, uh, pasteurization temperature. Then ultra heat treatment, 135 degrees C for one second. And sterilization, uh, where the canning is at 121 degrees C for three minutes or more. Again, these uh, depending on the size of the can, etc. Now, these are temperatures you won't have to remember. It's just a matter of interest, really. But as long as you remember that uh, high temperature is a method of food preservation. As is low temperature, keeping food in the freezer at minus 18 or lower, or a fridge at 1 to 4 degrees C. Uh, other methods of food preservation include pickling, using a high acid, which has got a low pH value, uh, such as vinegar, lemon juice, lime juice, etc. Then you've got dehydration, uh, which is drying. Uh, where you can add uh, salt or brine to food or even sugar to food to draw out the liquid and so it reduces its moisture content. Now a, a question I've seen come up in the exam time and time again is how do you make sure that dry food remains safe? And the answer is strangely enough keep it dry. Then some more methods of food preservation, vacuum packing, taking out the air, taking out the oxygen from a pack but even by doing that, it still has to be held under um, refrigeration once you've taken the uh, oxygen out. Because you get bacteria, which are called anaerobes, which don't need oxygen in order to multiply. They could still be inside the vacuum pack, fish or meat, etc. 
Uh, controlled atmospheres is really about putting different uh, concentrations of different gases into food. Smoking uh, is a good natural process. It's been used for thousands of years. And apart from giving it flavor, the food that is, um, it uh, reduces the moisture content on the surface of the food, but also adds um, chemicals uh, to the food, uh, acetaldehydes, for example, uh, which act as preservatives. And more direct chemical preservatives are used, such as nitrates, nitrites, uh, you'll get potassium sorbate and sodium benzoate. Um, always check the ingredients list on your food and you will find uh, there are some sort of chemical preservatives in there. What I always say to trainees and learners is if you don't know what the uh, chemical or the word is on the ingredients list, then don't use it. Use fresh. But I've seen so many uh, drinks, uh, foods with chemical preservatives in, uh, like potassium sorbate and sodium benzoate. Do you know what that's to do to your body? So if you don't, you know, you don't put that into food that you're cooking yourself. So why buy food with those chemicals in there anyway? Okay, so that's the end of Unit 3. Uh, revision test for Unit 3 is just down below, so I'll click the link. Uh, there are 20 questions this time, so a bit more searching. Again, just to reiterate, this is not part of the exam. Uh, you don't have to do a revision test if you like. But it will give you an indication of how the knowledge is sinking in, how you're retaining it. And it will help you in the final exam. So good luck with revision test for Unit 3.